our assertion here, our confession is that the worship of the church, the worship of the Orthodox Church, is in fact, what we have today, is in fact in total continuity with the Bible, with the worship of the Old Covenant, the worship of the Hebrews and the Jews, the worship of the tabernacle and the temple, and then uh, the preaching and the prophecy. Uh, And we also claim that the liturgical worship of the Orthodox Church uh, is in complete and total continuity and even identity, solidarity, harmony, unanimity with the worship of the earliest Christians, with the first Christians. And here uh, we would say right from the beginning that when many people hold that the way Protestants worship, uh, you know, with uh, praise and song and hymn and preaching and so on, that this is like early Christian worship, well, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> Uh, because the early Christians, first Christians, were Jews, and the early Gentiles were grafted to the Jews, and they were in a continuity of worship that began already and was recorded to and testified to in the pedagogical scriptures of the Old Testament, particularly the tabernacle in the wilderness and the Jerusalem temple. Now, of course, all of that is christened by Christ. It's eschatologized, it's fulfilled, it's made perfect, it's brought to perfection, in the broken body and uh, the spilled blood of Jesus, who's raised from the dead, who is himself the final teacher, the final prophet, uh, and uh, the final high priest, and the final king, and the final everything. So the New Testament is really the final covenant of God with man, predicted also in the prophets. You know, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, particularly the last chapters of Isaiah, all this is fulfilled in Jesus. So the claim here that we want to make today, and this is our point for today, is that liturgical worship uh, and liturgia, it means the common act of the people, the kachal of the church. So the worship of the church, of the covenanted community itself, the New Testament covenant community, our claim is that that would be the worship of the Orthodox Church. Now, obviously today, and we'll see this, Uh, The Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the Liturgy of St. Basil the Great, which are the two liturgies, Eucharistic liturgies, that are used in the Orthodox Church, uh, are certainly the development of the action of the belief and faith and Holy Spirit's indwelling in people through the centuries. Uh, So the actual form in which, and the words that we have in St. John Chrysostom Liturgy and St. Basil Liturgy were certainly not the words that were used in the earliest church. In fact, the words in the earliest church changed quite a bit. We know that in the Didache and in the Apology, the Dialogues of Justin and in Hippolytus' uh, Apostolic Constitutions, that the prayer, the Eucharistic prayers in the earliest church, uh, after the reading of the Scriptures, uh, uh, were often very free, but they had a form they had a substance, they had a rule, they had a, what would be called a canon, uh, a way of doing it. It wasn't just capricious and arbitrary and free-floating and spontaneous, and then it became formulated in different formulas of prayer in different places of the Christian world. And one interesting thing historically, although our interest here is not history as such, is that when you had the greatest uh, unanimity of uh, Orthodox Christian faith among the Christians in, let's say, the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, uh, and even in the earlier time before that, uh, where the Orthodox Christians who opposed the various heretics kept the same faith, which was called the Catholic faith or the Orthodox faith in the Catholic or Orthodox Church, you had the widest diversity of actual words and images and songs and, and so on. Uh, and that diversity existed through history. But what we're interested in in these series of commentary is how it all is now in the Orthodox churches, what is done now in the Orthodox churches, and how what is done uh, is in total conformity with the Bible. And it's biblical in, in its, not only in its words, but in its substance and in its style and in its spirit. It's completely and totally biblical. And being completely and totally biblical, it is completely and totally evangelical. It is according to God's gospel in Jesus. It's according to the eternal gospel, the gospel that is the heart of the final covenanted community of God with his people in Christ, in the broken body and spilled blood of Christ. So the worship in spirit, in truth, 
about which Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well, we believe is the worship of the Orthodox Church today. It had different uh, shapes and forms and substance and words through history, but it was essentially substantially the same. The forms may be different, but the essence and, and the content and the reality, the truth of it, was the same. But what we would say now, and I think uh, it would be a claim here, is that we're not so sure that we can say this anymore. We're not so sure about other rites and rituals beside that of the Orthodox Church, uh, because it may very well be that the rites and rituals of other churches, and even the churches that don't have prescribed rites and rituals, may be very, very far from the substance, the reality, the truth, the content, and the spirit of God's gospel in Jesus. They're just not dependable. We just can't affirm them. We can assess them. We could try to see what they say and so on. But that's not our interest, and that's certainly not our interest in in this present series of reflections. But the gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the gospels about how Jesus fulfills the scriptures how he was crucified, how he had to be crucified, how he is raised, and how he is glorified. And the Apostle Paul is very instrumental in even how the Gospels of Luke and Mark were written. And uh, this is done by the Holy Spirit in the earliest Christianity, but there were a lot of people who were distorting this and violating this and not preaching this. And they had their own forms of worship. And the same thing is true today. Those who pervert the Gospels, those who distort the Gospels, those who replace the God's Gospel with the Gospel of their own, gods who make up the Gospel, and those who even wrongly understand the 27 books of the New Testament, they all have worship of their own. But we Orthodox would say it is not the worship in spirit and truth that Jesus spoke about to the Samaritan woman at the well. It is not. It may have elements of it, and certainly does, Some of that worship may be even close to true worship, but it is not completely dependable and it is not totally of God. Now, here we Orthodox would say, Orthodox worship is. The Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil the Great, whatever you want to say about anything else, is. The Liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified Gifts, which is a special type of Eucharistic communion, which we'll talk about in the commentary, is. And in general, The services of the Orthodox Church are, but they have to be properly done, and they have to be properly rendered, and they have to be properly translated when they're translated, and they have to be properly understood, and they have to be properly explained. And this is no small task, because even these true scriptures canonized in the New Testament, and the true liturgy, and the true liturgies that the Holy Church has, are also perverted. They are also misunderstood. They are also misrendered. They are also not properly done. But our claim would be, when they are properly done and properly understood, then they are the totally dependable worship in spirit and truth that Jesus spoke about that day, that hot day, at noon, at the well, in Sichar, in Samaria, with the Samaritan woman. And that worship would be according to the gospel. Now, the true gospel, the right gospel, the only gospel that there is, the eternal gospel, this inspires the worship. God's gospel in Jesus, the only gospel that there is. The gospel that is witnessed to first by the Apostle Paul, historically, orally. The gospel preached by the apostles, the gospel that is witnessed to in the writings of the New Testamental Scriptures, the 27 canonical books, the gospel that is twisted and thwarted and perverted in apocalyptic and spurious and false writings that have existed literally from the time of Jesus himself, practically, just down to the present day, the gospel that is against all heretics and schismatics who pervert and distort this gospel and therefore have a distorted worship, It is ultimately the worship in spirit and truth, the evangelical worship of spirit and truth in the Messiah about which Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well. This is what the divine liturgy of the Orthodox Church is. But what we have to realize from the beginning is that we're commenting on a victory celebration, a victory of the glad tidings, the good news, that all of God's enemies have been destroyed and captured and are held in captivity 
that God's people are safe, those who believe in him can never be harmed, not even by death itself, that they already belong to the victorious kingdom and the victorious king who is Christ himself, and that this is already given to us in the church of Christ, and in that church we have the spirit and truth worship, the worship of God in spirit and in truth, about which Jesus spoke on that hot sunny day to the Samaritan woman who symbolizes the fallen world, the heretics, the Gentiles, those who need repentance as the bride of the bridegroom Christ. What we have witnessed to in the pages of the apostolic writings of the New Testament is the worship of the Christian church, of the community of the faithful. And this worship began in Jerusalem, but then it spread, and every single Christian church worshipped in the same way. They worshipped within the same reality. They worshipped according to the same events uh, in which they entered into by their faith, and they followed the same one and the same gospel and one and the same interpretation of the Old Covenant Scriptures in their communities. Now, what we can say very generally speaking is that the worship in spirit and truth of the Christian church testified to on the pages of the apostolic scripture is the worship of the community of the baptized and the community of the sealed. It's the community of the faithful. It's the prayer and the worship and, and more than just prayer, it's total worship, uh, action, activity. Liturgia is a New Testament word which means a common action. It's the common action of the believing community. So that's very important because it means that early Christians just weren't, you know, making up prayer groups or meeting together to pray as they saw fit or informing God what was on their mind or uh, worse yet, it's absolutely not the case that early Christian worship was unstructured and it was free and the first Christians just prayed however they felt like or however they felt inspired by God. Oh, no, no, not at all. That's simply not true. Read the New Testament. There was a structure of worship of the community itself done first in Jerusalem and then in all the churches in which the apostles preached and over which they appointed overseers and elders and in which they had deacons. And there was a very structure to the Christian communities in all of the places where they existed. And this is what we see in the pages of the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, this is how the church is constituted and that's how the worship takes place. There's the preaching of the gospel, there's the doctrine of the apostles, uh, and then there's the breaking of the bread, and then way back in the book of Acts again, there's the fourth thing. Those who were baptized and sealed continued steadfastly in the apostolic doctrine, the communion, the breaking of the bread, and then it says the prayers. And again, it's a definite uh, article, the prayers, not simply in prayers, but the prayers. The prayers were given. They were the prayers of the church herself. Now, certainly the earliest Christians constituted these prayers. They formulate them on the basis of the law, the Psalms, the prophets. But the prayers are given. People don't come to church to pray their own prayers. People come to church to pray the prayers of the church because the liturgy is the act of the church, of the community. Now, they bring their prayers. They bring their petitions. They offer them. They include them. But these prayers are objectively that of the very body itself the community and the communion itself. And that's what we see witness to on the pages of the New Testament. And then, of course, we see on these pages that these communities very early became structured. They had uh, elders, presbytery, presbyters. They had episcopy, bishops, overseers. They had deacons and servants. And then there were the virgins. There were the widows. And in Timothy and Titus, already in the New Testament, we see that there's a structure to the community. There's a structure. There are bishops. There are presbyters, now called priests. There are ministers, now called deacons. There are the faithful gathered together into one body. And in that one body, they are entering into the relationship of Christ with God in the kingdom of heaven. For example, the 12th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews uh, says it very specifically. It says, the Christians, when they worship, when they come together, what do they come to? And this is what it says. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the church, 
the assembly, the kahal of the firstborn, and Christ is the firstborn and we are all firstborn in him, who are enrolled in heaven to a judge who is God of all. You come to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect. That means all the saints are gathered there with the angels. You come to Jesus the Lord, the mediator of this new covenant, and to his sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. And then the apostle continues, be careful that you don't refuse all of this because you have received this in heaven, not just on earth. And he says, if the people didn't follow Moses, how much worse will it be for us if we don't follow the Messiah Christ? Then he says, therefore, let us be grateful. men, Let us be Eucharistic. <laughs> That's what it means. For receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and fear, awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And we have not only the letter to the Hebrews, but we have the book of Revelation. And many people think the apocalypse was itself a description of early Christian worship. And then once it was described, it became the scriptural pattern for Christian worship. The elders together, with their white robes, with their crowns, burning their incense, singing Alleluia to him who sits upon the throne, which is God, and to the Lamb who was dead and alive again, who is Jesus, who is enthroned with God on the holy altar. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is in all of the churches, according to the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And then they sing, Holy, Holy, Holy to God Almighty and to the Lamb. And then they participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb in the New Jerusalem, which is described in uh, the last chapters of the Apocalypse. So here you have a vision of Christian liturgy in the book of Revelation. And if you go to an Orthodox church today, you will see that very reality right before your very eyes. That is all actually accomplished. It is performed. It is enacted. God is, in, is acting there in the worship of spirit and truth in the final covenanted community of the baptized and the sealed who believe the gospel, who offer themselves to God together with Christ, and who participate in the Holy Eucharist.